All right, good morning. Well, it's Father's Day, so we should bring up the lights. And so now, if you are a dad, because it's Father's Day, you know we want to acknowledge you. So if you're a dad, a father, uncle, grandfather, please stand up and let us acknowledge you. Hey, happy Father's Day to you. Happy Father's Day. Thank you, thank you so much. Happy Father's Day. Okay, so that was the Father's Day message. And uh, <laughs> moving right along, so I'm going to begin. I have a great quote from uh, Helen Keller. Everybody knows Helen Keller. She says, security is mostly a superstition. It does not exist in nature, uh, uh, nor do the children of humans as a whole experience it. Avoiding danger is no safer in the long run than outright exposure. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. Oh boy, life is either, now this from somebody who was blind and deaf, and she's saying that life is either a daring adventure or nothing. And I think, wow, she is definitely hooked into something that I need to be hooked into. Mm -hmm. um, so for us in Science of Mind, I believe we would say this is an inner adventure. You know, uh, and this is uh, the pot that I want to stir uh, today for us is that um, what we do in the science of mind is that we cultivate um, an inner life. We cultivate a relationship with the presence of God. And although we say God is everywhere, the God that we will get to know and have a relationship with is the one that's within our own being. And so that's, that's, that's what this, this journey is. It's an inner adventure. Um, we quiet down uh, all the noise around us to listen to that voice that's within us, which we believe when that voice is love and gratitude and peace and compassion and forgiveness, we believe that, in fact, that is the very voice of God. So I wonder, um, have I ever really engaged in my own spiritual life uh, as much as I really wanted to? And this is one of the things I wanted to ask us today, because I think we would probably all agree it's a good thing to spend time cultivating a spiritual life. But I wonder if we ever give ourselves as much time as we think, you know, someday I'm going to really, really give that my best, best effort. So, you know, it's, it's, it's June now. The year is about half over. It's half water under the bridge. And I started thinking in terms of Father's Day uh, and relationship with my own father. And I realized um, shortly after I came into Science of Mind that um, my relationship with my father was not good. It wasn't horrible, but it wasn't as good as I wanted it to be. And so I thought, OK, I need to take these tools from the science of mind and work on that relationship. And so I did. I started to do that. And one of the things that, uh, that really occurred to me was that I had not said, I love you to my dad um, probably since I was a little, little boy. And so um, uh, I would call every week uh, back east to talk to my parents. And I'd talk to my mother. And then my father would get on the phone. And I'd say hi. And he'd say hi. And then we'd talk about the weather, and we'd talk about the price of gas, and we'd talk about um, deep, deep things like that. And, um, and just before he got off the phone, because I could always tell when he was about to hang up, I'd say, OK, Dad, well, I got to go. I love you, bye. I love you, bye. And I did this, I love you, bye, for about six months or so. And so it took only a couple of calls, and he was on to me. So it was like, who could hang up fastest? You know, Because I knew it was uncomfortable for him. And it was a little foreign to me, but I knew this was really important. This was part of my healing to be able to say this. Now, I will say, in, uh, in defense of my parents, they were always the kind of people who would say, never be ashamed to kiss your parents hello or goodbye, you know, because we didn't want to do that when we got dropped off at school, because it was kind of embarrassing, you know? It's like, no, I can't kiss you goodbye in front of school. And I remember my mother was the one who would actually say, she would say, you know, these kids who are out in front of the school smoking cigarettes and smoking pot and doing whatever they're doing, they wish they had parents that love them as much as you do. You know, it's like, oh, wow. So I'd get out of the car and say, hey, so you're kissing your mother, you know? And I'd say, yeah, you know, she loves me so much, it just wrecks her day if I don't wish her goodbye. And I'd just go on about my day. So anyway, so I have this thing going on with my father. And what happened after about six months is that my father got in on the program. So as I'd be hanging up the phone, I'd say, OK, Dad, I love you, bye. He'd say, love you, too. <laughs> like, whoa, whoa. And then over time, it started to slow down that every phone call would end with, I love you, Dad. And he'd say, I love you too, son. 
And I was thinking, OK, we're making some progress here. This is good. I just, and, and I could say progress. And again, there was nothing egregious about our relationship. There was nothing horrible. It's just that now I felt like, OK, I'm making a move closer. Mm -hmm. And so um, over time, this just got better and better. And so I was so excited by the progress I was making with the I love you dads at the end of the phone calls that I started, um, I started treating and I started doing affirmations and meditating around this and writing letters and throwing them in the fireplace after I'd written them and just sort of doing my own inner work to let anything that was standing in the way from me having a wonderful, loving relationship with my father, uh, just to let all of that go. And so I made tremendous, tremendous progress with that. And so six and a half years ago, my father passed. And I would say probably for the last 30 years of his life, our relationship was really good. And I'm thrilled about that. So at the end of his life, uh, just six and a half years ago, at the end, it was just he and I in the hospital together. And for about the last five hours that he was here on Earth, I sat with him and was praying with him and talking to him and singing to him and reminding him of stories uh, from when we were little and fun things we did together. And he very quietly passed on into the next dimension. And I just continued to sit with him. And you know, I can honestly say my experience with him was the experience of being complete. I don't know that I'd ever had that before with someone. But this, because we hear about, you know, are you complete with your relationships with people? And I was. I had not done horrible things. I had not said terrible things. I had no regrets. In fact, I had, in the last uh, three decades, had a great time with my father. We went on wonderful vacations together and baseball games and Al Pacino movies and all those father-son things that you do. <laughs> and, uh, and it was great. It was really, really great. So when he passed, my experience uh, my, my grief and loss around him was just that I missed him. Nothing else was mixed in. There was no, I did bad things, or I said unkind things, or I wished I'd showed up more, or I wish I had done more for him. I had done that. And I felt so, um, in such a foreign land, and a minister friend of mine, I was sharing with her, and she said to me, she said, Mark, this is what it feels like to be complete in a relationship. There's, there's nothing unsaid. There's no regrets. And, and so this is what I would like us to do today, to, to consider this idea of do we have a relationship where we feel not complete? Because if we do, I think that that incompleteness in that relationship um, dishonors the divinity that is within us. And I think that's my topic today, divinity within. <laughs> so somehow I had to link this together. Uh, <laughs> But really, I think that when we're not complete in a relationship, it's, 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 it's like saying the things of this relationship, the issue of this relationship are bigger than God within me and bigger than God within them. Now, we know that's contrary to spiritual truth. That's contrary to spiritual principle because the presence and power of God that's everywhere and within us is greater than any difficulty, even a difficulty in an interpersonal relationship. You know, so um, I think it's... Um, so, so I, would, I would ask us today to think about particular relationships in our life, and I don't know what those relationships, which relationships those are for you, but is there anything we really need to do to be complete in a relationship? Um, and now, I, I don't mean like, you know, stuff like, well, I got to take in the dry cleaning or return the wrenches to my neighbor or something like that, although I think that's a really good thing to do because of the karma involved. I'm wondering, is there some place we need to make peace, some place we need to let go? Um, some place uh, where we have not uh, acknowledged our love or appreciation for someone so that we can all move forward, right? Uh, things that we are incomplete with, it seems to me, zap us. They drain us of our own energy. That energy, that inspiration you know, that, that of spirit is is going into this incompleteness rather than spirit feeding us that energy for new things, for new experiences, for, for healing. So I think to remain incomplete, to have unfinished business, that's what I'm talking about. When I say we're incomplete in a relationship, it means we have some unfinished business there. It just doesn't support the spiritual being that we are. It's like saying, you know, my issues are bigger than the God part of me, right? And I don't understand. You know, we get involved in, in living our life, and. And it's so fast-paced. I get that. And, and, it's, um, and it's easy to forget 
the God part of us and the God part of other people. So, you know, there was this old um, Hindu legend that there was a time when all men were gods, but they so abused their divinity uh, in this Hindu legend that Brahma, uh, who was the chief god, decided to take it away from men and hide it where they would not find it. Now, where to hide it? So the lesser gods uh, were called in to ponder on this, and they said, well, you know, we'll bury it deep within the earth, and Brahma said, no, 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 man will eventually figure out and dig deep and find it, and they said, then we'll hide it at the bottom of the sea. He said, no, 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 man will eventually learn to dive down and get it, and he says, you know what we'll do? Uh, we will um, we'll hide it within man himself, and he'll never think to look there for it. And so the legend concludes that man has been looking everywhere for something that is already within us. Right? And so we look at great spiritual masters to learn, uh, from, to learn from what they have found you know, and how they found it. So if we look, we can say, okay, well, Buddha found it, and Jesus found it, and other great beings that have lived on the planet have found it. So that means if they found it, it's available for us. So... Um, I don't know about you, but there were certainly periods in my life where I felt like I was looking everywhere but within. That was like the last place I wanted to look, you know? I mean, I would fly across the country to go to a workshop or a retreat or, you know, buy a set of books or anything, but please don't make me look within, okay? I just did not want to look within. Because we think if I look within, oh my God, it's going to be really horrible. It's going to be horrible. But the fact is, no, it won't. It really won't. And, and now, initially, there might be... Um, some cobwebs in there, certainly, some dust, some debris. But, you know, our focus needs to be on our journey and our growth. If we are going to reveal the divinity that is within us, let's commit today to be complete with our past, you know, to be complete with anybody who we think has hurt us, you know, um, uh, and ex uh, or experiences that up until now maybe have defined us or shaped us in a greater way than they needed to. Uh, let's be complete with decisions that we made. Uh, what do I want to say? Sometimes we make a decision never to get over something and because we think, well, then I'm going to be letting other people off the hook. But what that does is that only hurts us. Right? So, so, so maybe we... Um, well... I want to say it like this. I'm always amazed when people want their lives to really flourish. They want their lives to thrive, but refuse to close the book on some past chapter. You know, that people just like, nope, I, I, I want to be all I can be, but I'm never going to forgive this one. You know, I want to be all I can be, but I'll never grow beyond that. I want to be all I can be, but I'm never going to recover from that. If, you know, um, because it's like, you know, people think, if I don't keep showing them how much they hurt me, they'll never understand how awful what they did was, so therefore, I will not thrive because I want them to understand what they did to me and how it's affecting me now, years later. Yeah. Uh, remember, remember the old saying? I remember there used to be a poster about this in the 70s, and it was this, that living well is the best revenge. Yeah, I can see that poster. There was a guy with a Rolls Royce, and he was supposed to be a really affluent-looking character. You, know, um, you are so much more than what you have been through. And I know this is so for all of us. Your life can be so much bigger than that. And you and I, we each individually, we get to decide. You know, that happened, but it doesn't get to define me. And I think that's an extraordinary thing right there. That yes, I have been through something, but it doesn't define me. Oh, I went through that too, doesn't define me. Oh, and I went through that, doesn't define me. They're just experiences on an infinite continuum that, that we have in life. You know, your life is so much bigger than the things that you go through, the experiences you have, or the people that hurt you. So, you know, yes, 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 I know, we all have a story. Everybody's got history, you know, uh, somebody drank and somebody screamed and, uh, you know, teachers said unkind things and somebody you love dumped you and somebody you were very good to doesn't speak to you anymore. I understand, I understand. Well, you know, they say that what doesn't kill us will make us stronger, right? So some of us should be very, very strong about now, don't you think? I mean, we should be like the Hulk. As you know, at least that's how I feel on the inside. We spend so much time focusing on out here. Right? In Zen, they talk about the moon and the water. And this is like human experience in Zen Buddhism. They say, if there is no water, there is no moon in the water. Right? And likewise, when there is no moon. 
right? But when the moon rises, the water doesn't wait to receive its image. And when even the tiniest drop of water is poured out, the moon doesn't wait to cast its reflection. See, but the water doesn't receive the moon's image on purpose. You know, uh, the event is caused as much by the water as by the moon, right? And as the water manifests the, the brightness of the moon, the moon manifests the clarity of the water, right? So there, there is no shortcut to the kingdom, right? By spiritual laws, growth is an unfoldment for all of us because we're all unfolding according to spiritual laws, that we are spiritual beings with infinite possibilities within ourselves. So Robert Frost uh, wrote the poem, and I know everybody's heard it, that two roads diverged in the woods. And he said, I took the one less traveled, and that has made all the difference. Less traveled, hmm. What's the road less traveled? Well, for us on a path of consciousness, I would say the road less traveled is going to be the high road, you know, because it's easy to take the ro low road. Like I always say, there's a reason the low road is the low road, because it's easy to get there. You know, just gravity alone and not caring and not being interested will pretty much take you down the low road. But the less traveled road, I would say, is the high road, the path of consciousness, the path where we are making an effort on a daily basis to forgive, to be grateful, to surrender, to be as conscious as we can possibly be. I would say most people probably don't know that there is a depth of inner splendor within them. You know, that, that, that doing spiritual practice reveals it, having a spiritual discipline reveals that. You know, it must be how Jesus knew I and the Father, Mother, God are one, right? There is no wall or a partition between us and the infinite. In, in Psalm 46, it says, be still and know that I am God. I like that. Be still and know that I am God. What an incredibly powerful thing to sit with. You know, and in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, it says, when he appears at the River Jordan to be baptized by John, he gives this amazing message. Uh, Jesus gives this amazing message of the kingdom of God is within you. Now, we could be transformed by the power of our own divinity. I mean, I know that's available to all of us, right? But when Jesus says, follow me, he's speaking of this high level of consciousness that he has achieved. I don't think it's about him personally. And in that consciousness, there is no past, right? So there's a place in consciousness where I can get to, where you can get to, where none of the experiences of the past that maybe have limited me or held me back or made me fearful or kept me small, none of that has any play, you know? There was a, that's the consciousness that I'm after, you know, in that consciousness where there is no past. And so I have asked myself today, and you get to ask yourself, where is my consciousness right now? Where is my consciousness right now? If it's in the past, then ask yourself, well, where really is that past? Well, it's, it's not here. I can't touch it. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, so it's not here now. So what is here now is that we wake up every day with a clean slate to move forward and create something new. I don't care how bad yesterday was for anybody. Every day we get up, we have a clean slate. We have a fresh start. We have an opportunity to be completely different than we've ever been. So whatever you experience, you are an expression of God right now. Think about this. What is someone or something in my life it would serve me to be complete with? So it may be an interpersonal relationship. I suppose it could even be a project or something in your life. But probably, probably a relationship, which if we finally took the hook out, if we got really peaceful with, it would free up some energy, and we feel like we could move forward with our life in a greater way. That's my hope, my prayer, my wish for everyone this Father's Day. Not only that, but that whether your father is here on earth with you or has moved on to the next level of expression, that there's nothing but love in your heart between you. Let's pray. So we turn our attention inward now for a moment to just reflect on this, that God is. And what God is, we are. And we are one. So we are one with all that God is, with all the love and the peace and the joy and the beauty and the harmony, that all that exists in the infinite mind exists within each and every one of us. We are emanations of the Most High God. And so in this awareness, I speak the word for each and every one of us today, that yes, not only is there divinity within us, but we recognize it within ourselves and everyone that we meet. And I claim for us today that if there is some area where we are incomplete, 
some relationship in our life, I speak the word for us that, first of all, we are willing, willing to have completion and closure in that relationship, and I know it's up to us. I also know that we will do and are doing the work we need to do spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, so that we can experience that completeness. I know there is nothing in the mind of God that holds us back or limits us in any way. And so I claim for each and every one of us an abundant, healthy, joyful life. We include in our prayer today our family members, parents, and children. We know that right where they are, God is fully present, wherever they are. We bring in everyone that we're holding in our heart today. And we say a silent prayer for them, wherever they may be, whatever they're doing, whatever they're going through. We just hold them in our heart and know that they belong to God long before we ever got our hands on them. And so we bless our church. And we bless all churches everywhere, synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And we let our prayer be a mantle of peace and love that wraps our entire earth touching all people everywhere. And so with an open, gracious, full heart, I give thanks that this is so. I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen.